Hello. Uh, hi, this is Tiffany from Craig Live. Is Butch Patrick available? Yes, Tiffany. Hang on one second. Sure. Hello. Hi, is this Butch? Yes, it is. Hi, Butch. This is Terry and Tiffany from Crag Live. How are you doing? I'm fine, honey. How are you doing? I'm good. I'm good. Uh, let me do the official introduction here, and we will get going. Uh, how late- long? How long will it, How long will this interview be? Uh, we usually go about a half hour. Okie dokie. Okay. Mm-hmm. All right. Ladies and gentlemen, we are back on Craig Live, and we are very excited to welcome our featured guest for this evening. He is an actor and a musician, someone you will fondly remember for his roles in shows like Lidsville, and of course, as Eddie Munster from The Munsters. We are very excited to welcome the one and only Butch Patrick. You're on the air with Terry and Tiffany. Welcome. Well, thank you so much for having me on. Wow, Butch Patrick. God, I grew up watching you so long. I'm, I'm definitely an original fan. Uh, I want to find out. I mean, Halloween's got to be your busy season. I know you had to reschedule here because of whatever it was, unforeseen circumstance. But but Halloween's got to be for you about like it is for Elvira. <laughs> well, yeah, we do keep very busy uh, year-round. But yes, uh, the month of October was uh, a double time for sure. So I want to talk about, you know, when you first got involved. Now, you actually started your career at the age of seven. And you kind of credit your sister for getting you into the biz because she was getting into acting and they actually asked her uh, if there was any children that she knew about and she mentioned her brother. Is that right? Well, that's not quite accurate, but I'll, I'll, I'll give you the lowdown. She, okay. was three years old. she was three years old and they were looking at her to have some, some uh, photos taken and during the ride up to the photographer, my mom brought me along and then after they were done with Michelle, he looked over at me and he took a couple pictures for his for himself, and he put one of my photos in his uh, Hollywood Boulevard studio window where a director and a producer were walking by and noticed the look that I had, mm-hmm. and they sought me out through that picture. Wow. I, I recently came across uh, a strange video like uh, pilots. Sometimes pilots are different than the, the series wound up being. And I was surprised to see that in the original pilot, it wasn't you, it was a different kid that was playing Eddie Munster, and man, I am so glad they wound up with you because the portrayal was so different. Have you ever seen that pilot? Oh, yeah, I have, and there was also a different mother. Uh, the, the character of the mother was named Phoebe, uh, portrayed by a woman named Joan Marshall, so yeah, they they not only switched me, but they also switched from the and that's called her Lily Munster as opposed to Phoebe. Right. right. Did they say anything to you as, as far as what they originally went with? And how they wanted you to act because your portrayal was much different in the fact that the other portrayal of Eddie Munster, he was more kind of wolf-like and animal-like. And yours, I know, I, I guess they probably wanted the the whole thing with you of, of the cute, appealing kid of the era of the '60s. Uh, did did they turn around and kind of tell you what they wanted, or did they kind of let you do your own interpretation? Yeah, I was never aware of the other of the other kid, uh, the other pilot. So what I did is I just basically uh, read the dialogue as I interpreted it uh, of myself. And luckily for me, not only on the, the monsters but on a lot of other work that I did, my uh, my feeling and my interpretation was was good. And occasionally, you know, it wouldn't be, and then they would ask you to do it differently. And that was that's really the trick to acting is yeah. being able to tweak it for what the director wants. But for me, I was very lucky. A lot of the times, I was, uh, you know, my, my my delivery was what they were looking for. Right now, how did it? And knowing that the pilot had another actor, uh, when they went in to recast Eddie, I mean, what was the audition process like for you? And in getting the role, was it basically like an open call, like a cattle call, or, or what was the process like? No, by the time they had flown me out for, I just went directly to the studio for a screen test. I, I. Uh, Bypassed all the uh, the typical auditions and callbacks mm-hmm. that the other two kids had been on. Uh, but I think there was like seven or eight uh, callbacks was the number that they had achieved. And then, as you know, like they had actually hired Happy Derman, and then at the last minute, the network stepped in and said, "No, we want to uh, we want to recast the, the mom and the child." And that's for me. I just basically got off the plane, went directly to 
CBS Studio Center where they give me, gave me a script and wardrobe, and the next day I did a screen test. I don't imagine that at that young an age that you were kind of aware of, of the great movie career that Yvonne DiCarlo did. I, I imagine maybe later on you figured that out. But did your, your mom say anything to you about what a big star yeah. she was? Yeah. Yes, she did. She 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 made me aware of uh, who I was working with, and uh, it was funny because uh, I, I as I was walking to the, to the uh, studio, I passed Bob Barker, who was doing the Truth or Consequences out mm-hmm. there, and I was familiar with him from watching him on, on his game show. <laughs> but uh, and they also they also had some soap operas going on out there at the same time as well. But yeah, but she did uh, she did uh, uh, enlighten me to Ivan DiCaro's status. I was really happy to read in my notes. And I would assume it's true. Sometimes you get these things on the internet, and you don't know if it's true or not. Yeah. That, that you really befriended Yvonne DiCarlo and kind of like was her caretaker in in the last days of her life. And is that true? Well, you know that's sometimes things get out on the internet, that, and, I, and I'll clarify that as well. Yeah. Yes, I was friends with Yvonne, and, and yes, I did introduce her to some people that helped her get into the Hollywood picture motion picture homes at the end of her life where she was well taken care of. As me being a personal caretaker, that is not accurate. Okay. But um, we did we did make sure, and through through an introduction that I had, she was taken care of. It just wasn't really me. It was more of an introduction to a third party. Right. Well, I know you became good friends with Al Lewis, too. Is that right? Absolutely. Al and I were, like, very, very close uh, from the time I was three to the time of his uh, passing. I've got to know, Butch, because the thing that I liked about Al is he was salty. Okay, like, <laughs> like he, at any given time. Uh, was there times on the set when he was around you as a kid and maybe some language came out that shouldn't have come out? Because he's been known to do that a few times in public. No, he was able to turn it off and turn it on. And when I was uh, on the set, everybody was on their P's and Q's. Uh, <laughs> maybe, maybe late night on Fridays after I'd gone home or when I was in school or something else. Other than that, but around me, uh, it was all uh, all very G-rated. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, as we're doing this interview, we're getting uh, questions submitted from uh, the listening audience. And I have to say that one of the top questions that I'm getting, yeah. I, I don't know if you've been asked this before, but they're wanting it, to know... It's something you probably have no idea what the answer <laughs> would be. In your creative opinion, they're wanting to know how it can be that... Herman Munster, who is Frankenstein's monster, essentially, mm-hmm. and Lily, who is more modeled after like a vampress, could have a werewolf son. So it's basically what we're doing here is we're taking a line out of the Simpsons where Apu says, you tell me, Andy Munster, your father was Frankenstein and your mother was a vampire. How in the hell did you ever become a werewolf? <laughs> I, I think are we l- close? Yes. Are we close? <laughs> yes. I, I think Lily yes. was probably cheating on Herman, <laughs> I, I, hanging no, out he, with Lon Chaney. <laughs> the answer is creative license in Hollywood. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> wow. You know, to be who you were on that set and and be a child and that whole world, it looked like a lot of fun. I, I know you said in a recent interview or, or an interview in the past also. Uh, that most of your memories are of, of playing on the set and fooling around and goofing off as kids do more so than actually doing some scenes, if that's correct. I mean, is that right, that, that you really remember playing around on the set and, and can you kind of give us an idea of some of the things that you did when you weren't shooting? Yeah, it was, you know, basically you're there for 70 episodes and if you have a regimented work week of Monday and Tuesday or reading and rehearsal and Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, you're in makeup and you're filming. So, you know, over a two-year period, it kind of all runs together somewhat. But when you have free time and you can break away, which I did as often as possible, you would go explore other people's sound stages and other people's backlot sets. And my favorite destination was usually the McHale's Navy Lagoon because <laughs> it was outside, number one. And, right. uh, and Ernie, Ernie Borgnine was very good with kids and Tim Conway was a a very young up and coming uh, comedian actor um, and then I'd also I would also go up to see my, my uncle would supply horses mm-hmm. to a lot of the westerns and western props stuff. so we had wagon train and the Virginian were also shooting so whenever we would uh, you know get a chance to go do something like that I would uh, I would head east or head north depending which way 
I was heading and go visit other people other than the Munsters. Right. right. Now, you can see the house on the Universal Tour. I've been there many times. But as far as the interior, because all those houses are, are shells, that was in the right. studio there, right? Which, which studio was it on the Universal lot? It was, it was, well, the Universal was the studio, you know, Universal Studios. That was just, the house was located on a street called Colonial Street, uh-huh. which uh, also had the Beaver House and the Marcus Welby House and a few other famous houses. Yeah, the, the, the house, the set itself in in for the interiors was really great. I've got to have you talk about now. Everybody thought it was cool. At least I thought it was cool as a kid that you had Spot the Dragon uh, it, with the lights on, and when they're not shooting this. And I mean, how was that made up? I know it was probably some animatronic thing because they don't have CG back in those days and everything. What can you tell us about Spot? Well, it wasn't even. It was even before animatronics. It was basically a uh, a dinosaur head, some some somewhat like a T Rex, but more like an Allosaurus that was used in the Lost World movie in the early fifties on ah. Universal. And a lot of studios never throw anything away because you know you never know when you may need right. a dinosaur head. Right. Um, it was hinged on a um, very much like an a, like a garage, an old garage door hinge mm-hmm. with springs. And two guys in the back would basically, you know, uh, manually open with a with a lever. The jaw would bounce. It was it was hung on springs, and then they had lights in the eyes and uh, gas mains that would ignite like a um, like a barbecue, somewhat, you know. And that was the the fire jets and the lights. And there would be a couple guys back there bouncing it up it was behind the curtain. And there you have Spot. And when you saw his tail, that was basically a. Um, a tail from the same dinosaur <laughs> that they uh, put uh, air air uh, hoses in to make it look, you know, wag back and forth. It was drug around on something similar to a uh, a moving a moving um, a man little thing with four wheels on the bottom of it mm-hmm. that right. would allow, but that would allow you to move furniture. So, it, it, was there ever an incident when he blew fire and he caught something on fire? We were discussing and laughing earlier because Universal seems to have a lot of fires. Uh, e- even though they have a fire department on the lot, was there ever any accidents with with the uh, fire uh, coming out of uh, uh, spot? Uh, so a couple times I was well, not a couple times. One time I was sitting on the banister and it, it, it was a little too warm and singed singed the hair <laughs> on my legs, my knees, uh, and stuff. Yeah. Wow. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, I wanted to ask you, Butch. I mean. Uh, you were about 11 years old when you landed the role of Eddie Munster and it became so iconic and and so much connected with you and the other you know core cast of characters uh, how was that I mean as you grow up you grow up you become an adolescent you're a teenager how was that in, in kind of dealing with that did you feel like you were typecast and like you couldn't get past that well the the term typecast, by the nature of it, means that you know I would be out seeking employment, wearing velvet shorts, and a widow's peak for forty <laughs> years. Um, so that actually wasn't the case. So um, literally, I was—I had the best of both worlds. I was Eddie Munster, but as soon as I went on to do other things, obviously I was going out as Butch Patrick myself, and I was very easy. I was very lucky that I, it was easy to continue working. Which I did. I went over to Disney. I, you know, the Adam Twelves, the Monkeys episodes. My two sons for four or five years as Ernie's best friend. I did a lot of work um, after that. So the Munsters were a two-year window, but being Eddie Munster didn't really follow me around as much as it did Fred Gwynn and Al Lewis. Yeah, right. for sure, absolutely. Right. Uh, talking about the Monkeys, because we've talked to several people who's been on the Monkeys. And they all had different stories. I mean, what is your story with being on the Monkey Night? I believe it was a Christmas episode, right? I did the Christmas episode, yeah. I, I actually think that I was a huge Monkey fan, obviously, who was there at 14 years old. Yeah. Um, the Beatles had come on the Munster set. I missed meeting them. I was off the day. They were there for some reason. And wow. not that the Monkeys were the Beatles, but the Monkeys at the time, in 1967 and 68, were huge. The show was super popular. I was on the second season. And it's full, you know, it was, it was it was about as popular as it ever was. And then the interesting part was the Christmas episode. They uh, they were hired to babysit me, was basically it. Right. And as it turned out, I was the adult-like child that they were to babysit. And I was in almost every scene with them. Plus, it was a Christmas episode. Plus, it was a, a Christmas message. 
and the fact that at the end of the at the, at the end of the episode they they sing a very nice acapella reissue mm-hmm. and then they also break down the fourth wall where they introduce everybody that helps make the monkey show by bringing on the crew the secretary and the director all on camera right. so it was a very very wonderful moment the last two or three minutes of this episode was just great especially being the Christmas episode so I felt that I probably did the best episode they ever did and the fact that I was in every scene with them and I had a chance to work with them as an equal was really a wonderful time for me I was very I was very proud of that show I mean being a fan uh, of the monkeys uh, and, and you know, being a teenager at the time, and, and that's when music was mm-hmm. great and everything. I, I mean, did, were you really starstruck? I mean, was it hard uh, to talk to them off camera? I know once the camera starts, you're a pro and you start in. But I mean, what was it like for you as, as far as meeting them? I mean, w- were you still kind of starstruck, or they just became just another actor? Just another actor. Um, I, I kind of found Peter to be the easiest and accessible, most accessible. That sounds uh, right. Davy was. Th- Davey was great, but Mickey, because he was a child actor, yeah. you know, who the circus boy, we had some, something in common there. Uh, and Mike was Mike. You know, Mike was just like you would expect him to be, kind of a little bit off the, the quiet one, and the, you know, the, the brains behind the, the antics, because the other three were having a great time, especially Peter and Mickey. Right. Uh, and, you know, it was, it was a wonderful experience. It really, really was. And I'm, you know, friends with them today. Obviously, Davey passed, but mm-hmm. the rest of them, uh, yeah. And I, recently ran into Mike, but Mickey and Peter, I, I would see them all the time. I Very consider cool. them good friends. You know, something that people really should see, and I don't think it's out there, uh, I saw it when it was new on television, was the Munster special at Marineland. That had to be fun to do. Yeah, the carnival thing, that was great. It was a kind of an Easter special. Um, and yeah, at Marineland, uh, you know, way before SeaWorld and all the water parks, there was Marineland and Pacific where they shot Sea Hunt, Lloyd Bridges' right. street, uh, which was a very cool place down in, near where I lived in, in California. So for me, it was not only fun not having to go all the way to Universal Studios, but we could just go directly up the hill the other direction to hang out for a week at a place that I always used to go to. Right. Well, you know, in, in doing the Munsters, you, you know a show's big when they get to do a movie. And Munster Go Home was a great film produced by Universal and released theatrically. Uh, I imagine you guys were all like old home week because you were so used to doing a TV series. But was it different for you doing the movie? Was did it seem bigger, more exciting? Uh, you know, was, was it a bigger deal to you, or is it just like doing another TV episode where you did the movie? Well, it was different because of the color factor and the uh, whenever you do, for instance, three days of filming. A 24-minute series takes three days, so you add that up, that's like eight minutes a day. Right. Um, but you shoot a six-week uh, a six week shooting schedule for a movie, it comes down to about two minutes a day of actual usable footage. Mm-hmm. So everything is slower, it's bigger, it's more all rehearsed, the color is brighter, and the, the scenes were more and the, and the fact that the series had been canceled and we knew that this movie was the last the last go round for us to actually be working together right. uh, added, added, added a little dimension to it as well. Well, I'm happy to say that Monster Go Home is the Monster movie because there hasn't been a Monster movie made. Uh, they've done several Adams Family films. Are you glad they haven't made a Monsters film? And 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 if they had a Monsters film, I mean, who do you think should play you? Well, that's you know that's I really haven't kept up with the child actors of the, of the year. I know the Bonnie Bird Wayne uh, attempt that they did, even though it wasn't really a feature. It was it was shot similar to a feature um, five years ago. They had Mason Cook who who was, who was good at it. He was you know went over to do a lot of Disney work. And he's uh, keeping very busy. Uh, as far as the the full blown feature budget movies like the Adams Family did, I don't think the Munsters is ever going to do that. They did the the remake series for Lloyd Schwartz, Sherwood Schwartz's son, mm-hmm. in the mid '80s, and then they did the Munster's Revenge in the early '80s, which was a sort of a TV movie with Alan Freddie right. rising the role of Annie Von DiCarlo. And then they did they done a scary little Christmas, and then they did the Munsters Today with Edward Herman playing the Herman Munster, and we all did a cameo in that before Yvonne and Al passed. Um, but I think I think the thing uh, with the the big screen version, I don't think that's I, I, I think that's Universal's got the rights to it, and a lot of people have approached them with it. And I think that they're just kind of scared to tarnish the image any more than they have because they've got a very good 
merchandise and licensing agreement with a lot of people because the Munsters has carried on the show itself, the original show. Mm -hmm. They've done so well with, with T-shirts and lunch boxes and, and die-cast cars and all of that, that they have an ongoing guaranteed residual effect that I don't think they want to tarnish or jeopardize. I, re I really enjoyed Mockingbird Lane, but I, I couldn't believe... I don't know what it was. It, I guess they wanted a more realistic thing or whatever. That they went without makeup and stuff. I mean, there really wasn't much as far as a look of them looking like the Universal Monsters. How do you feel about that? Well, I think that they were figuring they could take the, the concept of the Monsters and use like an Adams Family look about it because, you know, the Adams Family basically didn't have makeup except a little bit for Lurch. Right, right. Um, and, and I think they were trying to do a crossover between the two and wind up with the Munster family with an Adams family look and uh, I didn't think it was I didn't think it was awful I thought it was kind of unusual but um, they saw fit not to green light it after spending 10 million dollars on a pilot with yeah. A-list director and A-list writers <laughs> <laughs> incredible incredible uh, another question I wanted to get in from our audience uh, before we run out of time here is that they I'm getting a lot of people that's asking about a project that we love here I don't know if you get asked about it a lot uh, but that was your work in, uh, you were the lead role in the Phantom Toll Booth, and of course being directed by Chuck Jones and working with people like Mel Blanc and Dawes Butler. What was it like working on that project? That was actually, uh, after the Monsters and the Monkeys, the Phantom Toll Booth was a, was a very um, great thing. I worked very hard to get that part, and when I got it, I was, I was extremely happy because, number one, um, I really enjoyed working with Chuck. Loved his cartoons. It was his only feature film. Um, the the perk that I didn't anticipate was spending all the time in the studio with Mel Blanc and Dawes Butler and uh, Hans Conrad and Jude Correa and all the great voiceover people. Wow. Because Chuck pulled in, you know, everybody came rallying around to help Chuck do his only feature film. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So he had, he had the best of the best. It took a few years to do. Um, the animation part of it, we only, you know, the, the live action only can and closing sequence was only a few days, but um, going back in every three or four months to do a few more pages of dialogue was awesome. You know, that, that was very enjoyable. And and Chuck does a great cameo, like a Hitchcock cameo, sitting on the uh, the cable car with me at the beginning of it, which was awesome. Right. I I really miss those days. I love movies that mixes animation and live action, like like The Incredible Mr. Limpet or stuff like that. Yeah. And, and Phantom Mary Toll. Poppins, Mary Poppins. Yeah. Mary Poppins is a good example. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Really great stuff. Uh, uh, there's a lot of people that, that wants to know about Lidsville. Now I heard you say in an interview, and it was brought up by another friend of mine that does a segment for the show, and he interviewed her. And you know who I'm talking about in a minute. I interviewed her. But I heard that you accepted the role of Lidsville because you wanted to meet the cute British girl from the Buckaloos. Is that true? <laughs> yeah, Caroline, Caroline Ellis. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, when I was, I was, I was on the interview. Uh, I didn't want to do the show. You know, I, I basically went up and I looked around. I said, you know, this is kind of childish, literally, it's a Saturday morning show. Uh, and I wasn't very interested in it. But I did notice a big picture of the Buckaloos. And I and I said, and what's all of that all about? And they go, well, that's a show we just finished, and that's so, 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 so. Mm -hmm. And she caught my attention, and not personally, but I saw a picture of her. So when I went back, I said, well, maybe something good will come out of this, and maybe she'll show up for work one day. And she never did. She was back in England. <laughs> right. Well, we were, we were talking about it because, like I said, I know Caroline, and, and so is my friend Ghosty. And we brought it to her attention, and she was very flattered and said that she yeah. wants to apologize personally to you <laughs> for not being there, and she now feels guilty because uh, I've actually spoken to her. On, I've actually spoken to her. On, not spoken to her uh, in person, but uh, messaged her on Facebook. So apparently, she's in Portugal these days. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, she's she's. You <laughs> had good taste. She's cute, but but I'll tell you, yeah. you're married to a lovely lady now, so it's all's good. All's good. Very good. Uh -huh. Now, I, I heard that at one time, uh, when you were not living out here in the L.A. area, uh, that you owned and was renovating a gothic mansion that, that had a haunted history. Is that right? Yeah, my grandma's house. I uh, Actually, I do own it right now. And uh, cool. I lived in it right after I did the Munsters. I went back to live with my grandmother. I was 13 in the eighth grade. And I spent about, I think, about six to seven months back there, uh, most of the school year. And over the years, she sold a house in the 70s, but over the years, I had childhood friends, and whenever I'd go across the country, I'd try to drop in and just catch up every few years. Well, um, 
about seven or eight years ago, my friend told me the house was vacant and it was going to be probably demolished and, uh, you know, people were going to put duplexes up on the property because it, was, it wasn't a huge piece of property. It was like an acre and a half and it, it was a strategic part of town where the road went around this particular house and it was the oldest and most, solid, the most famous house in town because the uh, the guy that did all the coal mining, he was, a, he was like a coal bearer. He mm-hmm. built it and uh, they spared no expense so it was a really cool house. I wound up buying it and then as I taking possession of it, my sister enlightened me that it was haunted and <laughs> to keep an eye out for keep an eye out for Miss Ruby, who was Elizabeth Wardell, who was the daughter of Thomas Wardell, who was murdered during a labor dispute. And one thing led to another. And everybody that you know, every town knows the house is haunted and lo and behold, it is. And I've had a lot of people there with professional ghost uh, hunting capabilities and they found that it's built on a paradox excuse me, a vortex which Leads it to be very active with a sort of a crossroads of ghost, ghost travel. So, yeah, wow. I, own a, I own a very active haunted house. It's for sale right now. I've had it three years, but um, I'm ready to move on. It's, it's a small town. I don't spend a whole lot of time there anymore, but I did save the house, put a roof on it, made it livable, and made it sale ready so somebody else can now move into it and make sure it doesn't get demolished. Well, everybody should check that out. Yeah, I guess it's like, what, you can look it up on Zillow or something? I mean, <laughs> Yeah, it's on, it's, on, it's on that, and you can also just go to MustardsEvents at gmail.com, and uh, there's a lot of uh, footage of the house and other things that we've done. It's, it's my YouTube channel, and yeah, but you can find on Zillow. On, on Zillow. Very cool. Very right. cool. You know, I, I can't think of anybody more perfect to own a haunted house. I mean, Jesus, it's, it's <laughs> absolutely perfect. I, I've got to ask you, because I was a big fan of the show, uh, you decided to produce a horror-hosted movie show with a young lady named uh, Ivana Cadaver and Macabre yep. Theater, and, and uh, that's not being done anymore. Is that right? No, I, that was something we started back in the 2000s. 2002 when I was living in Orlando um, I pretty much left it after the, the initial season she's been working on it ever since then and I believe it's on YouTube America still mm-hmm. and she's been doing a lot of interviews and red carpets out of the west coast I don't live in Los Angeles yeah. it, was a, it, was a, it was a fun vehicle and uh, one of the things I'm doing now is that I, you may or may not remember Super Scary Saturday for Al Lewis for TBS oh. back in the 80s yes, yes, yes absolutely, absolutely. So yeah. The same, the same gentleman, Jeff Grimshaw, that did that for Al, is uh, developing a show for me. Together, we're going to do something called Eddie's Monstrous Movie Mausoleum. That's going to be a live stream uh, subscription channel and project, which will come out after the first of the year or so. You can keep an eye out for that. Uh, it's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to, we're going to specialize in the worst movies ever made. <laughs> and I'm going to have guest uh, hosts share with me every week, like... Um, Dr. Paul Bearer and Sid Gooley and anybody that anybody that I can offer my services to on their show, they can be on my show and we'll be reciprocal. So it's going to work out really well, as well as probably on Monica Dabber. So, so she, oh. she would be welcome to come on as occasionally as does Dr. Paul and, and anybody else. Perfect. Well, that's great. And hopefully we, we see you more, and I, I assume we will, because I, I like you know the thing with Ivana Cadaver, and I, I certainly liked looking at Ivana Cadaver. I mean, <laughs> good looking lady, but but I really enjoyed your segments, and I didn't think your segments were were enough of them. I wanted to see you more on that show. Well, thank you. This, this way, I'll be on my own show. I'll be there. I'm going to be kind of the straight man, and the uh, the other horror host will be the comic relief. But we're looking forward to doing it, and uh, yeah, I'm excited because Jeff did a really good job with Super Scary Saturday, which I guessed it on several times. I'm looking forward to working with them again. Just well, real exciting. quick before we end here, there were three Maryland's. Which one was your favorite? I assume it was probably Pat Priest. Uh, well, Beverly Dolan took me on my first date. I had a huge crush on her. She took me to see <laughs> Mary Poppins at the Grumman Chinese Theater. So Bev, Bev was there, but Pat has become a dear friend and was, did a wonderful job. So I was lucky to have really you know feelings for both Maryland's. Right. There you go. There you go. And uh, I wanted to ask and, and just mention um, that Butch is, thank God, Butch is a cancer survivor. And I wanted to yeah. tell you how happy we are about that and check in. Everything going okay with your health? Yeah, actually, uh, the cancer is no problem there. I have a clear case of health. And I also, in the, let me see, what's the date today? The 17th? Mm-hmm. Uh, in, four, in four days, I will celebrate eight years of sober living. That's awesome. Congratulations. Mm-hmm. 
Thank you. Yes. All right. Well, uh, I'm assuming can uh, fans get information about the upcoming show and everything off of your website? It's at Munsters.com, right? Absolutely, Munsters.com, and uh, everything from that. The official Munsters fan group is uh, 19,000 people strong almost, and we have uh, many Facebook presence, uh, many uh, Facebook pages. Butch Patrick and Butch Patrick too, but Munsters.com will lead you to everything. Perfect. And we promised our friend Michael Gray from Shazam that we would tell you that he <laughs> said hi. <laughs> Michael Gray, yeah, he's a good guy. I've known Michael forever. We were both Teeny Bop idols back in the day. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I actually guest starred. I actually guest starred on Shazam once. Uh, yes. And he said it was like his favorite episode. He said, Butch is awesome. You have to get Butch on. <laughs> yeah, tell, him, tell him I said hi. Thank you so much. I absolutely and, 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 and it was good of you to, to, to you know share the spotlight with him because it, it's hard to share the spotlight with Michael. He had his really great hair. <laughs> and his, his hairdo that it was so awesome. <laughs> I, sound, I sound like a 16-year-old girl. I need to go. Yeah. <laughs> Like All right. You're fanboying you're fan out. Right a little away. bit. A yeah. little bit. All right. Thank you again, Butch, so much for spending some time with us. We encourage our listeners uh, head over to Butch's website, Munsters.com. And uh, happy early Thanksgiving. Same to you. Thank All you right. so much. And thank Bye-bye. you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.